Hello, my name is Gary. And my name is Simon. And this is episode 19 of EV Musings, a podcast about electric vehicles and things that are interesting to electric vehicle owners. On our podcast today, we'll be updating our most popular podcast episode, Myths and Legends, with some continuing myths that either persist or have sprung up since our first episode. Before we get started, I want to ask you, Simon, the new Instavolt 125 kilowatt chargers we've heard so much about, how fast do they charge? Uh, 125 kilowatts? Actually, no. We've talked previously on this podcast about the new Instavolt 125 kilowatt chargers that have been rolled out across their network. I was following a Twitter thread this week as Instavolt prepared to switch on a bank of these chargers in Norfolk. Yay! And someone posted up a spec sheet of the actual chargers themselves. It appears that our understanding of what we're getting from these chargers is inaccurate and has not been corrected by Instavolt at any point. Our understanding is that these charge point 250 units are supplied with 125 kilowatts maximum shared between groups of two chargers. Folks on Twitter have been thinking that this means that if you're the only one using a charger, you can get up to 125 kilowatt charge speed on your charger. If someone else plugs in, it drops it to a maximum of 62.5 kilowatts per unit. But the spec sheet disproves this. In fact, the charge point 250 units are capable of 62.5 kilowatt charging maximum. This means that while the 125 kilowatt charge is shared between the two units, it's limited by each unit itself to 62.5 kilowatts. I'm disappointed in Instavolt for not clarifying this earlier or, by omission, failing to correct any misunderstanding that has arisen during discussions about this. Bad Instavolt. So I um, I had a chance to test these new 125 kilowatt chargers on the way back from a uh, Oxford meet. And I, like you, thought these were 125 kilowatts each. But actually, you're right, each limit, each uh, unit is limited to 62.5 kilowatts. And I'd actually noticed that when I'd finished charging on the, on the readouts, they were reading 62.5 kilowatts on the display. So, like you said, or uh, looked like they've been limited in some way. Now, whether this uh, is the local electricity that they just physically can't get enough through to those, or if there's a reason why they've limited them initially while they, while they try these out. But, if they're if they're putting 125 kilowatt chargers in and that's what they're meant to be, then that as a, a consumer, I'd expect to be able to use uh, from from that unit or at least a, a good portion of it. If I was a Jaguar I Pace or a Audi e-tron owner that can do those kind of speeds or even a Model Three, I'd be a little bit annoyed that you know my car can do this and yet the charger is touting that it can do it, but I actually can't so yeah it'll be interesting to see what instavolt come back with and um if they if they change it so if or if there's a reasoning behind why they've they've split that down our feature topic today is exposing more misunderstandings misconceptions and downright lies about evs in our first podcast episode one we talked about some of the myths and legends surrounding evs These are the things that detractors or just poorly informed people use when trying to counteract the rise of EVs in the country. We covered five in particular. Where does the power come from to charge them? It's fossil fuel, right? Batteries will need replacing after three years and cost a fortune. The batteries need precious minerals to be mined to create them. Electric cars are much more expensive than petrol or diesel cars. I'll never get an EV until it can do 500 miles and recharge in five minutes maximum. If you want to listen to that episode, the link can be found in the show notes for this episode. Now we're back with a second round of myths, misunderstandings and misconceptions regarding EVs. But I want to say that there is an underlying reason that a lot of these are being spouted by uninformed people. The reason is that a lot of them are based on the situation as it was back in the dim and distant past, i.e. 2011. The situation was dire, charging was fossil fuel based and the cars had batteries with issues. The problem is now that things have moved on, the situation has changed, but a lot of the mainstream media have not yet caught on to this and are peddling the myths from the days of yore. A prime example is the recent Top Gear episode where they left everyone with the impression that a 24 kilowatt hour early model Leaf can only do 35 miles on a charge. What they didn't make clear is that the particular example they had in the studio only did 35 miles, but that isn't typical of cars of that vintage. But now people will think that a Leaf will only do 35 miles on a charge, which is blatantly inaccurate. So let's work through the entries for today. Myth number one, you spend hours at chargers with an electric car. Actually, no. I average a thousand miles per month and spend five minutes, 20 seconds per day on average at a charger. 
that five minutes usually gets me around 3.6 kilowatt hours and costs me yeah, 40p. There's a fundamental misconception about electric vehicle charging where people try to equate it to the way fossil fuel cars are charged. However, they should be equating it to the way mobile phones are charged. You charge your phone while you're doing something else. I mean, it takes an hour or more to charge a mobile phone, but nobody seems to have an issue with this. Why do they have an issue with EVs doing the same thing? We've also said several times on this podcast that if I asked you to take your phone every few days to a specific location, like an Apple store, for example, which could be miles away from your house, where it would be charged quickly with some magic juice that cost a fortune, you would quite rightly tell me to sling my hook. But we're happy to do that for ice cars. It just makes no sense. The actual time I spend physically plugging in and unplugging my car per day is less than about 20 seconds. I don't wait for it to charge because it generally charges overnight. If I'm out on a long journey, I usually spend around 15 minutes, 20 maximum at a rapid charger. Obviously, bigger batteries take longer, but charger speeds are now getting quicker. It's interesting to note that on his recent world record setting challenge, driving the longest distance in an electric car in 24 hours, Bjorn Nyland actually only charged his car to 64%, taking 17 minutes each time to do so. He managed 2,781 kilometers in 24 hours, that's 1,728 miles, or the distance from Land's End to John O'Groats and back again, less 20 miles. You think you could do Land's End to John O'Groats and back in 24 hours? Google Maps reckons it's almost 15 hours one way, and that doesn't include refueling stops in your ice car. So no, you don't spend hours at charges with your electric car. So myth number two. EVs release huge amounts of CO2 in their manufacturer, and they're worse than fossil cars that way. No. There was a report produced recently by a university in Germany which made the startling claim that diesel vehicles are better for the environment than EVs. Excuse us while we throw our heads back and laugh loudly. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, indeed. This report has been refuted several times. For a start, it looked at lifetime emissions for an EV, but only manufacturing emissions for an ICE vehicle. Secondly, it was sponsored by a fossil fuel funded organisation, BIAS. Thirdly, it relied on power for the EVs being produced using coal, which Germany did at the time, rather than renewables, which most EVs use at the moment. The majority of an EV's CO2 emissions are in the manufacturing process. That's true, but once manufactured, the CO2 emissions are almost zero. Even then, vehicles such as the BMW i3 are made in a carbon neutral factory and all the public EV charging, at least in the UK, is via renewable energy. As the grid greens up, EVs get greener, whereas a fossil fuel car will never have a CO2 footprint as low as the day it left the factory. Every single mile travelled in an ICE vehicle adds more pollution to the atmosphere. This is doubly so when you consider that every gallon of petrol has had to be refined using quite often dirty electricity and transported to the petrol station from the refinery using diesel before being turned in the engine. A large number of people using EVs at the moment in the UK also have solar panels on their house. They use this free, renewable and very, very, very low emissions fuel to power their EVs. So no, EVs are not worse than fossil fuel cars for CO2 emissions. Myth number three, the batteries explode without warning. They're a fire hazard! No. Fossil fuel cars and hydrogen fuel cell cars to a greater extent carry explosive liquid in a tank in the car. Every day in the US, for example, 600 ICE vehicles catch fire. Some of these are reported in the media, most aren't. Unless the fire is a spectacular one or it causes collateral damage. So that's your baseline, carrying a tank full of highly flammable liquid every day and 600 fires in the US alone. So what about battery powered cars? There have been battery fires in the EVs. It's true, the battery technology in lithium ion batteries does lead to a phenomenon known as dendrites, which are growths on the anode and cathode caused by charging. Over time, these can extend across the electrolyte inside and cause a short circuit if they touch. Once this happens, a battery will burn. The fire can be spectacular. However, the incidence of this happening is negligible and proper charging can mitigate the effects. 
Furthermore, as battery technology updates, solid state batteries and capacitors will remove this as an issue. The dendrites will never form. For more information, see Ewan McTurk's channel. Um, and he talks about dendrites and batteries in general. We'll put a link in the show notes. So to summarize, 600 fires a day in the US alone from carrying explosive liquids is no issue. A minor number of battery fires through a short circuit apparently is the end of the world. Got it? So myth four, the government will get wise and start taxing them. It will just be as expensive to drive an EV in the future as it is to drive an ICE vehicle now. Yes, that's right. At the moment, the government is subsidising EVs in the UK and elsewhere. There is a plug-in car grant, OLEV grants for home chargers, no vehicle excise duty and no congestion charge. It is charge in London. The government recently announced changes to the benefit in kind tax for company cars that are EVs. It's now financially worth it to get an EV as a company car because the tax is lower. Also, electricity is being provided at cost plus basis for public charging, or free for some of the slower chargers. This makes running an EV very cheap. But once the number of EVs hits a certain level of these, incentives will go. The PICG is limited to a certain number of vehicles sold. The excise duty has been removed as, it, as a means of encouraging take-up. As fuel duty from fossil fuels drops, alongside income from the vehicle excise duty charge, the revenue from motoring that hits the Treasury's coffers will decrease. The government will then have to find alternative ways of replacing that lost revenue. In the best case scenario, they will keep increasing the tax on fossil fuel and fossil fuel cars until it is uneconomical to run on ice. But this will only work for a certain length of time. After that, the government will start to tax EVs, or it will tax electricity for charging, or it will do both. This means ultimately the cost of running an EV will rise to the point where it will be as expensive to run as it is to run an ICE vehicle now. But so what? You will end up with better technology, a nicer car, a better environment, and the cost to you will be no greater than you're paying at the moment. We're in the heydays of EV adoption at the moment. If we can't take advantage of that for fear that these days won't last forever, then perhaps we've already lost the battle. Finally, our fifth myth or misconception. There aren't enough charges for the number of cars that will be on the road. No. There aren't enough charges now for the number of vehicles that will be on the road in the future. That's true. But remember, this isn't a one-to-one -one correlation between petrol pumps and charges. Just because we have 8,000 petrol stations and around 24,000 pumps, it doesn't mean we'll need 8,000 charging locations and 24,000 chargers. The model is different. The reason you need that many petrol stations is because ICE refueling is an effective oligopoly. There's only one place to refuel your internal combustion engine vehicle a petrol station. With EVs, it's not the same. You can charge them anywhere there's electricity. This means the demand for chargers will not be the same as the demand for petrol pumps. This is a fundamental misunderstanding that ICE vehicle drivers have when it comes to charging. They look at this as a like-for-like -like model. In actual fact, they should be looking at EV charging in the same way they look at mobile phone charging. You do it anywhere you can, Everyone does it without an issue and nobody makes a specific journey to go to a monopoly location to recharge their phone. It just doesn't happen. Until people start to look at EV charging that way, there will always be the misconception that everyone will need to go and charge up at a rapid charger every day and for that we'll need millions of them. Uh, don't get me wrong though, we absolutely need more chargers than we have now, purely for redundancy purposes so that any outages or comms errors can be dealt with by using an alternate charger but we don't need anywhere near as many charges as people think we do. There are billions of phones on the planet. Nobody seems worried about there being electricity to charge them. So why are EVs that different? So let's wrap up by seeing if there's some cool EV or renewable thing we've come across that we can share with our listeners. Yes, here's mine. So my cool stuff this week is, um, I suppose, a bit of a throwback from, from the olden days, really. I was walking around uh, a local museum of mine and um, they had a penny farthing in there, one of the old bikes and those that don't know that and I'm definitely not old enough to remember them. 
um, but you had a giant wheel at the front and a very tiny wheel at the back. They looked completely impractical to ride and very painful, but these were kind of some of the first bikes out there, and now it seems that they may be making a comeback. So I've been reading an article, and we'd, uh, we'll put this in the, the links below, but a, uh, a firm hopes to have rideable prototypes completed by the end of this summer of a new type of penny tharvin. Taking the same principle as uh, a big wheel at the front and a small wheel at the back, it'll be completely electric. And uh, this has been designed by uh, a pair of London South Bank University graduates. And if you look at the design that uh, is in the link, the two wheels actually fold onto each other and allowing for uh, them to be locked, to be, I presume, uh, carried. Um, but it's electric as well, so it'll avoid any of the normal kind of, east, uh, of the uh, grease and oil and maintenance that normally come with uh, bikes, albeit it not, not a great deal. Um, but again, this is something uh, completely new, and um, it looks quite cool. It, um, it, it, uh, it's definitely aimed at city communi- commuting, along with some of the other e-bikes and e-vehicles. Unfortunately, at the moment, it may be subject to some of the issues that they're having at the moment in terms of law but i'm actually hoping that uh, this uh, this comes through it looks a very cool design it's a, a modern take on an old uh, an old uh, vision of uh, of the penny farthing but um, take a look it looks it looks great um it was recently shown at a conference in westminster back in sort of april may so this is not a new new thing but i've, I've recently come across it but you'll have top speed of about 15 miles an hour, you'll have LCD screen and things like distance travelled, heart rate and things like that as well. So um, they're being developed at the moment and um, hopefully we'll see them on the roads very soon. My cool thing is an article from, of all people, Autocar. They had a Kia e Nero on long-term loan to one of their journalists and he was getting to the end of his eight-month loan when he realised that with the range of the e Nero, he'd never had to charge using public charging. So he went on an 800 mile road trip and he brought back 12 points that he learned. Read the article to see what he discovered. It's great because it's well written and very well balanced. It doesn't paint EVs as being flawless, but it also understands that they are different to ICE cars and they need to be dealt with differently. My main takeaway was the comment that Ecotristy are not fit for purpose at the motorway service areas. How much longer before Dale Vince does something about this then? And that's our show for today. Hope you enjoyed listening to it. If you want to contact us, Simon is at The EV Side on Twitter and YouTube. And I'm The Real Gary C on Twitter. If you want to contact us on Twitter, use either of those or our own EV Musings Twitter account, at Musings EV. Don't ask. If you're wanting a quick reference ebook to read on your Kindle, I wrote a little something called So You've Gone Electric. It's available on Amazon Worldwide for the measly sum of 99p or equivalent, and it's a great little introduction to living with an electric car. Links for everything we've talked about in the podcast today are in the description. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe. We're available on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Please leave a review as it makes us feel loved and it gives us better visibility for other people trying to find our podcast. Thanks for listening. Bye.